Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Al Brown. Um, been asked to give you a 50 minute uh, talk on sort of my reflections on what is actually coming up for 35 years in, in fire engineering. Um, you'd never guess from the, the natural highlights in the, the hair. Uh, I started originally in uh, fire risk engineering in the insurance industry uh, back in 85 with uh, factory mutual. Um, but I was lucky enough to uh, be trained in the uh, design and uh, plan review for sprinkler systems, um, water supplies, uh, a lot of construction issues at that time, including uh, sandwich panel construction, all those issues, but mainly from a property protection point of view and looking at business interruption uh, for industrial plants right across the world. Um, initially, UK, all the way down into to Africa, Europe, and then lastly, as I moved into the semiconductor industry, uh, I was involved uh, with plants in the Far East in the States and uh, throughout Europe. In 1999, uh, I moved into my own consultancy, Rush Group Consultants, set that up with uh, four other uh, engineers, um, all of whom were chartered at that point. And, and we hit that just at the right time because um, if you look at it in round about uh, 2000, uh, the IFE started registering the first uh, chartered fire engineers. And uh, I was lucky to be one of the first uh, in that, that cohort. And was actually involved in the, the process of merging the IFE with what was the Institute of Fire Safety. But at that point, I moved into consultancy. I was involved in a broader range of fire safety, fire safety engineering, life safety, and, and so on. But throughout the whole of that time, I'd been involved in fire investigation uh, and expert witness work to uh, a greater or lesser extent. And that led me to, to join uh, HKA um, in 2018, um, giving up Rushbrook Consultants just short of our, our 20th uh, anniversary. So it's been an interesting uh, period. We've, we've obviously come a long way uh, over, over that time. There are a lot of changes, which uh, many of which we, we, we know about. But one of the questions that was asked to me recently was, well, what have we actually done in that time? Since we registered the, the first professional fire engineers in, in the UK back in, in 2000, um, have we impacted on fire deaths, for example? Uh, have we improved building fire safety? Uh, have we helped construct buildings where fire losses have been reduced, um, or is it possibly the other way? And have we reduced the construction costs for uh, companies and developers? And I suppose the thing that comes across to me, first of all, is there has been a reduction in, in fire deaths generally over that period. But is it due to fire engineers, or is it due to other aspects of fire engineering? Changes in materials, the use of fire alarms, and so on. Um, the activities of the fire service in fire safety visits, uh, particularly in uh, domestic premises. In terms of improving building fire safety, I think we are all pretty well aware of the, the issues we have right across the, uh, the UK with fire stopping and passive fire protection. Uh, installation problems. Um, so have we picked on, up on that? Did we pick up on that at the time? Um, <clears throat> or is it something that we knew about and, and didn't necessarily do anything uh, to correct? Certainly fire stopping was an issue when I was in the insurance line. It was something we looked at, it was something we picked up on when it was obvious. But like most of us, if it's, if it's hidden behind a wall, if it's hidden away, then you're not going to necessarily find it. You need to be there during the, the construction project to, to identify many of these issues. Um, why is it acceptable to allow a building to burn down just because we've got people out building safely? You know, yes, we need to protect people, but we should be building buildings that are essentially sustainable that we can put back into operation uh, uh, fairly quickly. You can never <coughs> prevent fire damage, but you can limit that fire damage. 
Um, we have the technology to do that. We have the, uh, the materials, we have the protection systems. We can limit the damage, but so often, for a variety of reasons, we, uh, we fall down on that. And have we reduced the cost for the construction industry? Now, this is one of the areas that is quite often promoted as one of the benefits of fire engineering. We can reduce the cost of uh, passive fire protection on steelwork. Um, we can increase the lightable space in buildings and so on. And I think we've probably been very successful in, in many of those areas. But if we look at the total cost of construction, all the way through to uh, the operation of the buildings, and we look at some of the um, increasing number of disputes that we're seeing, uh, dealing with deficiencies and defects in, in construction, the passive fire protection issues that I've mentioned before, ACM cladding, the sort of thing that I'm now dealing with on a daily basis in, in the expert witness side. I really wonder whether or not we've been successful in reducing costs as a whole to, to industry. And that, that shows through to um, the PI costs that consultants are now paying. Um, I was talking to a colleague recently who's just uh, started his own consultancy. And the rates that are the annual premium he's been quoted for his PI insurance is 18 times higher than it was when we started Rushbrook Consultants back in, in 2000 uh, for exactly the same turnover. Now that's because of incidents uh, like the ones that are listed there. Uh, and of course the, the La Crosse uh, fire in uh, Australia was the one where the fire engineer was actually held to be most responsible for the, uh, the, uh, the liability. So it does bring into question our involvement. Um, we often, when, when I get involved in this discussion, there's of, often a point that's made, well, the scope of works didn't cover that particular aspect. We weren't asked to review the cladding, for example. We might have been asked to review the compartmentation, but the cladding on the outside of the building is not part of the compartmentation. Therefore, the detail of it was, was not necessarily part of our scope of works. Uh, we're only responsible for the fire strategy, not for the implementation. The strategy is passed on to someone else. Um, I was only asked to analyze one particular aspect. You know, it might be the, um, uh, the strength of a beam or something like that within a, a particular area of the building or the means of escape in one particular part of the building. But does that excuse us from not highlighting issues which we may be aware of? I think as, as professionals, I think we have a, a responsibility for that. And part of it comes through the, the code of ethics and uh, ethical principles that are actually required as part of our registration as uh, professional engineers. But interestingly, on the IFE website, on the requirements for membership, that actually doesn't mention them anywhere. That's maybe something that we could, uh, could highlight. We also highlight the uh, 25 hours of CPD, but I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. So looking at the, uh, the ethical principles, they're a broad range of statements. They're generally, they, they're intended to capture a whole range of activities that uh, engineers, chartered engineers in particular, are uh, responsible for. But I do think that we can embed these within the work that we do on a, on a daily basis. Some of it might take a little bit of tweaking to actually link into what we do, but I think if we try, I think it, it will actually help. We talk about uh, honesty and integrity, and one of the areas we look at is you know, being alert to the ways in which our work and behavior might affect others. Now, obviously, the fire strategies we develop is one area that that we, we can actually uh, affect people. We can identify the issues. We can take a holistic view uh, and making sure that we cover all the aspects. Respecting life, law, and the environment brings up some interesting ones. 
ensure that the work is lawful and justified or complies with you know, the uh, legislation. Quite often, one of the things that we find in the expert side is we get into this debate as to whether we've had compliance with legislation or compliance with the guidance. So technical handbooks, ADB, and so on and so forth. And people quite often focus on the detail of what's in the guidance, forgetting what we're trying to achieve with the, the functional standards themselves. Uh, protecting and where possible improve the quality of the built and natural environments and I think that includes choosing the right materials understanding how those materials perform not just in a, a laboratory or a, a test facility but as we were hearing earlier once they're actually out there and exposed to real world fires which are <coughs> going to be considerably more severe in many cases than we'll ever see in a uh, a fire test lab and the last one there is one that I, I had a, uh, certainly had a problem with in the, the, the fallout from or the aftermath of, of Grenfell in that any other event of that type in another profession the professional body would have stood up we would have put people forward we would have talked to the media but we didn't. We allowed other fire experts or fire consultants to stand up and take our place. Now, as professional fire engineers, that's really our role. That's what the IFE should be doing. Now, there's obviously issues. We've got potential conflicts of interest and uh, our employers might be looking to get work in particular areas. But as an institution, we need to find a way of dealing with that. Hopefully we won't have another Grenfell but we may have a similar type of incident in the future and we should be able to respond to that. So, keeping our knowledge and skills up to date. Um, this is where I, I diverge from the uh, perceived wisdom on, on CPD. This is the you know, 25 hours of CPD, half an hour a week. How long does it take you to read a, a magazine? Something like that. It probably takes you about 20 minutes, half an hour if you're half an hour if you're reading it cover to cover. Is that really CPD? Coming along to the odd event, is that really enough for the development and of a fire engineer and you know maintaining your competence as we uh, as we go forward? Some of that CPD could be participating in consultations, getting involved in uh, committees, standards committees. Uh, we've got BSI committees, there's the NFPA committees, which uh, they're always willing to, to allow international members to, uh, to participate in if they have uh, the relevant experience. There's a whole range of things that we can do as engineers, which expands our knowledge, expands our experience, and feeds back into the, to the profession. So if we look at <coughs> the typical fire engineer's development, you've got the first degree, you've got two or three years of initial uh, professional development, taking you up to the point where you can uh, register as a professional engineer. And thereafter, this, this 25 hours of, of CPD. <coughs> I think looking back over my career, I was trying to get some sort of estimate, and I think I was probably somewhere between 40 and 100 hours a year on, on average. Uh, that includes going to conferences, technical committees, and so on. I know that back in 2000, 2001, I was probably doing four or five weeks a year at conferences and uh, participating in, in technical committees. So it helped not only me develop as an engineer, it helped the business. I made a wide range of contacts. So there is a, another benefit from there. But it allowed me to have a much broader understanding of the needs of clients, <coughs> regulators, uh, equipment suppliers, materials manufacturers, and so on. Um, so it is definitely a, a benefit. Um, 
and hopefully we can sell it to to employers who are willing to uh, to fund that type of commitment. So, really, just a, a quick run through in, in terms of uh, my career. You know, I I'm proud of what we've achieved as fire engineers, but we can't be complacent. I'm really uh, infused by the quality uh, of the, the engineers that we're producing, um, the enthusiasm that the young, young, younger engineers have, and I think we need to try and capture that. Um, there's a time and a place for people with experience and people at my age and, and older, but we have to use the, the, the young people in the industry to, to help move us forward. They're going to be the future leaders in, in the industry. Um, it's our role, if we're managers or uh, business owners, to support those those uh, young engineers in their career development. I think we also have to reevaluate our role in fire safety engineering, trying to capture some of these issues, taking a much more holistic view. I know that some consultancies are already doing this, trying to get involved right through uh, the construction process. But I think we have to get away from the narrow view that we've maybe had in the past as to uh, whether different aspects of fire engineering or, or fire are involved in fire engineering. The examples might be, you mentioned fire stopping uh, earlier. Another one is flammable uh, atmospheres. Many fire engineers will just, you know, flammable atmosphere, it's not something I should be involved with. But the flammable atmosphere is what you have above a solid surface, which allows it to burn. <laughs> So it's all part of understanding the nature of burning materials. Um, yes, it's a specialist area, and I wouldn't expect uh, any of us to walk into uh, a chemical plant and do a, a full disease evaluation or, or something. But we should be aware of these issues. We should be able to comment on them. Um, integrating the ethical principles into our daily activities, I think, is, is something we should be really looking at. I think many companies do that with the, the behaviours that they expect of their uh, their employees. But we should do something similar with the, the code of ethics, try and link that to what we do on a daily basis. Um, and step up to uh, participate more in CPD activities. Um, we can't just leave it to the, the one or two individuals that are arranging these events for us. We all have to take our play our part. And try to be more involved in the institution and I said in politics there as well I think I think that's important um, because a lot of the fire safety decisions that are made are political decisions it's a decision as to whether or not we spend money in a particular area whether we allow um, additional costs on industry to provide fire protection um, so there are this political uh, questions as well as just simply being involved with the likes of the the IFE. That's all I have for, for you at the moment. Um, I've uh, certainly enjoyed the opportunity and uh, I've certainly enjoyed the career I've had so far and I've got no plans of retiring in the near future, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs>